Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our panel today. It is my pleasure and my honor to speak first on our panel. Uh, my name is Hunter Klee, and I'm a graduate student at The Ohio State University. I'm pursuing a PhD in Chinese language pedagogy. I've been teaching Chinese for the past seven years or so, uh, the last five of which have been spent as a graduate teaching associate at The Ohio State University. And I must confess that over those past seven years of teaching Chinese, I have actually given the question of diversity and inclusion uh, in my own teaching surprisingly little consideration, uh, to be quite honest. I thought, perhaps like many language instructors, that because I was teaching a foreign language and that I was teaching a less commonly taught language, that I was already doing my part to introduce some aspect of diversity and inclusion to Midwestern university students uh, in the United States. Um, I've since learned that that's not quite the case. There is always something that we can do more to further these, these tenets of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our teaching practices. In 2020, we saw how a collection of social movements arose, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement to end Asian hate. Uh, these movements arose out of response to acts of violence against ethnic minorities in the United States. And universities across the United States, across the world even, responded, many reaffirming their commitment to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in their administrative affairs as well as in their course content and curriculum. My own department, the Ohio State University Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures, put forth a statement uh, reaffirming our own commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'll read just a, a brief excerpt of that for you. It's rather long, so we'll just read this small, small part. Through various initiatives and activities, our goal is to support and encourage all members of our department to practice DEI in our daily teaching, research, administrative work, and social interactions. It was this line about incorporating DEI into our daily teaching that really made me begin to reevaluate my own instruction and make sure that I was evaluating critically how I was interacting and interfacing DEI with my own students. Now, our curriculum revolves rather centrally around the use of several textbook series, and so I decided that it would be useful to begin by examining how these tenets of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion may or may not manifest in two textbook series that I was familiar with. So I began to explore specifically these two series, the first one being Chinese Communicating in the Culture by Dr. Galal Walker and Dr. Yong Lang, and second, the Perform, uh, the Perform series, featuring different texts such as Perform Suzhou, Perform Qingdao, Perform Guangzhou, all written by Dr. Uh, Jian Xiaobin and uh, other authors as well. Now, I chose these two textbook series for a couple of reasons, the first of which being uh, familiarity. Uh, I'm a graduate teaching associate at the Ohio State University, and these are the two textbook series that we use. So I was already fairly acquainted with these materials. But there's also uh, something interesting about these texts that I, I felt was worth exploring a bit more deeply. Because these texts feature audio materials in their format as an absolutely critical component in the materials. Indeed, to use CCC, the first series, Chinese Communicating in the Culture, it is, so it's impossible to use these books without the audio materials. The practice exercises, the dialogues, the grammar instruction, all occur through audio. And without it, you can't quite engage with the text fully. Similarly, for the Perform series, the audio materials are critical for understanding the, uh, the lessons and the exercises that accompany them. And so I wanted to focus on, on this aspect of the text. Now before I uh, began exploration, I did a little bit of preliminary reading and found that current research on East Asian language textbooks, uh, the reviews that exist, and there are many, especially in recent years, uh, have a somewhat limited scope. Uh, textbooks, textbook reviews that currently exist focus, of course, on learner representation, that is, our students of these foreign languages, how they might see themselves represented in the text, and also how the target society is represented. The way that these two questions are analyzed tends to be with regard to the visual aspect. What photographs are chosen in the textbooks? What sort of characters appear in dialogues and lessons? 
So in this, in this regard, the scope is somewhat limited to visual media. And so I chose to take a somewhat different approach and incorporate a multimedia lens in my review of these two textbook series to see how oral media, this aspect of language textbooks, is, which is actually absent from current research, might be included in the future. So let me begin by discussing how representation manifests in oral media, starting with the textbook series CCC. Audio materials in this textbook take center stage. Of course, they are the core of the uh, language lesson. The first set of audio materials that students encounter, lesson zero, which is classroom commands and classroom instructional expressions, uh, features 10 different speakers of Chinese, 10 different language speakers. So immediately, students are introduced to quite a variety of speakers. And each of these speakers is introduced by name, including where they come from, and a little bit of information about their background. So here we can see that there are speakers from Beijing. One is introduced as coming from Wuhan. Another, from Shanghai, is also described as having spent several years in Beijing. And this may cue students into this possibility that though there is some geographical diversity in the speakers, this may impact their pronunciation style, this may impact their delivery of certain lines in the textbook, and that this, uh, and the fourth speaker from Nantong is described as coming from a smaller city just north of, of Shanghai. While not stated explicitly, this sort of introduction and specificity can give students an idea that not everyone from China is from Beijing. Not all Chinese speakers come from the same place. There is geographical diversity, and this is made uh, rather explicit in the audio material. Learner voices are included in the audio materials as well, particularly in exercises where students are meant to uh, engage in dialogue with the material. But learner voices are never considered models for poor dialogues. Even the dialogues where we have a learner of Chinese speaking with a native speaker, the learner's voice is always recorded as a native, and that's, that's hearable. Um, again, re uh, recorded learner voices are always followed by natives as a sort of model of correct standard Putonghua, standard Mandarin pronunciation. Oral representation in the performed series is somewhat different. In the performed series, we see textbooks featuring roughly the same format and similar content, but tailored to different cities in China, so that each textbook, each titular city, gets some in-depth exploration. So the first textbook published in the series was performed Suzhou, performed Qingdao, and performed Guangzhou came uh, somewhat afterward. By having textbooks, whose central focus of several American students studying abroad in a university in that city, by having textbooks that focus on different cities, this myth of the sort of Chinese monoculture that says Ch Beijing culture is China, that is what it means to speak Chinese, that sort of myth of a, a Chinese monoculture is significantly challenged. And it provides some richness to the student's understanding of a very specific uh, Chinese city that they can then transfer in their own studies when they go to study abroad there, hopefully. Um, dialect is not conveniently swept under the rug in these texts. There are a couple of lessons where students, there, there's one lesson in particular, where students do hear dialect spoken in the lessons. Now they're not required to learn to speak it. These textbook series are about Mandarin Chinese. But this does indicate to students that dialect is a part of daily life in these different cities, and it's something you may hear, and you want to know how to interact with people who speak it. Uh, yes. Let's take a look at an example uh, lesson from the performed series. Specifically, in every textbook, lesson 2.1, we have our main character, Zhou Dan Rui, an American from, uh, from the United States, a uh, student of Chinese. Uh, gets on the bus and has a very brief interaction with a bus driver who asserts his identity as a local and sort of insists on using local dialect to interact even though Danre is a foreigner who probably just knows Mandarin. So let's take a look at an example. This first book uh, performs Sujo, written entirely in Mandarin. So the dialogue is, Joe Danre gets on the bus, he tells the bus driver where he's going and then asks him, how much to get there? The driver replies, two yuan, insert your money here. 
we can imagine that he's pointing to that silver box on the bus. Danray checks his pockets, pulls out a 10 yuan bill, and realizes, ah, I don't have change. Uh, can you break a 10? The driver, who probably sees this all the time and is a bit tired, dismisses Danray and says, ah, I don't get change. Let's listen to the audio. So this is all in Mandarin, and the first textbook, uh, Tian's uh, Sujo, performed Sujo, occurs in Mandarin as such. Subsequent texts, for example, performed Qingdao, we actually hear the bus driver assert his uh, identity as a local and speak to Danre in dialect. Let's listen to that. So, I'll point out that in the whole textbook series, these are really the only two lines where students are introduced to dialect, and it's not something they're forced to learn throughout the text. It is not a Qingdao Hua textbook, but it, is, it does give students an opportunity to interact with uh, this idea of dialect in daily performance. Let's see how it works in Tian Guangzhou. So you can see how these lessons may introduce students, if used appropriately in the classroom, a teacher might set up this sort of situation where the students are acting out a role play. You need to get on the bus, you need to know how much it costs, and now you've got to interact with a driver who may or may not be willing to speak Mandarin with you, and this gives students an opportunity to engage in this sort of performance. Now, I don't speak Cantonese, but if I were to engage in this sort of uh, rehearsal in class, I could sure cue up the audio of the Cantonese speaker, assume the role of the driver, and then hit play. Now, the driver probably does know some Mandarin and can interact with the students, so there's opportunity for negotiation, for clarification strategies, and for this sort of interaction between the, the learner and the instructor in role play scenarios. So, I'll summarize a couple other findings from CCC and the Perform series. There were positives in both of these series that I found, as well as a few concerns. On the positive side, we found that uh, male and female voices are roughly equally represented throughout the material. We see representation of three learners throughout the entire CCC series, two of whom their ethnicity is specified textually and through photographs, the first being Li Ouyang. Ouyang, his surname, Li, his given name, is a graduate student at an American university, and uh, a, uh, a, a Chinese-American at that, who interacts with a visiting scholar. The second person we meet is Professor Bai, who is uh, depicted in the textbook as a black professor at an American university who interacts with that same visiting scholar. And so while both of these characters are actually recorded, unfortunately, by native voices, I think it, this may be a, a place for improvement where we could actually have a competent learner voicing these characters. Uh, we see that, the, uh, that we have representation of Chinese American learners and uh, non-white learners. The third learner uh, is left uh, ethnically ambiguous. Already, this somewhat challenges a trope that I have seen in many Chinese textbooks of uh, David and Mary go off to Beijing to frolic together, and they're both drawn white in the textbook. So this sort of uh, turns this, this trope on its head. Um, I have a couple of concerns in, the t in this series, however. Uh, as I said, learner voices are not considered models. Uh, regional linguistic differences are not engaged. By that I mean, in the textbook series, there is a character who is from Taiwan, but does not speak in a way which is markedly uh, presenting Taiwanese Mandarin. So pronunciation, tonal differences, or even Taiwanese uh, Mandarin um, grammatical structures are not presented. I think that this is a potential room uh, for, it's a gap, and maybe a place that could be improved in the future. Also, these textbooks feature no LGBTQ representation, which is unfortunate. I believe there is a solution, however, to this problem, which is the incorporation of supplemental lessons via audio material. So for example, in CCC lesson 5.3, drill number three, there is a situation where we see uh, an American working at a Chinese company 
and uh, the Beijing co-worker asks the American if they have completed a task, and they use me to indicate completion. This is a pattern that students are expected, a form that students are expected to learn to interact with. The student replies, have you picked up, have you picked up the equipment? I have, I picked it up yesterday. We might add a supplementary exercise, which provides a bit more uh, inclusive uh, instruction in a more Taiwanese uh, production of a, a, man, a Taiwanese Mandarin form, which would be to include yo, to ask if someone has uh, engaged in this, uh, if someone has had an experience or done something. So this is something that uh, occurs in, in Taiwanese Mandarin, but is not present in the text. I think this would be a great opportunity to show that there is some difference uh, between uh, something that might occur in mainland Mandarin versus in, in Taiwanese. So, it is my hope that uh, by bringing this to everyone's attention and discussing this with you, we might, as instructors, better incorporate oral, oral media into our lessons and harness the incredible potential of, uh, of supplemental lessons that feature the actual voices of diverse uh, speakers of Chinese and include that into our students' lessons. By having students engage in interactions and rehearsals and performances, with this sort of uh, diverse array of, of Chinese speakers, we might improve our own education by incorporating these tenets of diversity and inclusion in our daily teaching practices. Thank you very much for exploring these textbooks with me.